If you want to pump your body and expand your mind, there's only one place to go. Mind Pump. Mind Pump. With your hosts, Sal Stefano, Adam Schaefer, and Justin Andrews. In this squeaky clean <laughs> episode of Mind Pump. Squeaky buttholes. For the first 45 minutes, Adam, Justin, and I start off with our usual conversation. We talk about uh, the resurgence of old brands. Oh, yes. Adam's got on that Stussy hat. That's right. Yeah, and wait, then wait for the big dogs. Wait for them Jenko jeans to come yeah, back. Jenko. <laughs> <laughs> Not happening. We talk about the song by the Childish Gam- uh, Bambino. No, it's Gambino, Doug. Gambino. Yeah, yeah, not Bam- yeah. It's another Italian name he, steal- he stole yeah. uh, for his song called This Is America. A little controversial. Yeah, and then it started getting yeah. heavy after that. We did. It talk- we talked about how experience creates subconscious judgments. We talked about the strange romanticization, that's not how you say it, of Karl Marx. <laughs> I guess close. Karl Marx had a re- recently had his 200th birthday, and people uh, are celebrating that asshole. Yay, murder! Yeah, we talk about the NBA addressing mental health. Pretty cool. That was cool. The importance of the hu- of human connection, and then we talked about a dessert that I made with Organifi Gold Juice. Definitely making this. Coke, full fat coconut milk from Sometimes the can. Sometimes you're brilliant, sir. And protein powder from Organifi. Now they are our sponsors. They make organic supplements, high quality products. If you go to OrganifiShop.com, enter the code MindPump, you'll get a discount. We also talked about the fad of fasting. Of course, they're going to take something good and ruin it. Those bastards. And and we talked about 24-hour fasting and stem cell regeneration in a study that I uh, had just read over the weekend. Then we get into the questions. The first question was, do we think people can be super successful entrepreneurs if they haven't had a hard life? Seems like these days everybody who's super successful uh, grew up uh, under difficult circumstances. Is that a prerequisite for entrepreneurial success? Should I kick my kids out of the house? <laughs> the ne- you want them to be successful? Yes. yes. The next question was, you know, if uh, if maps, you know, programming is superior, then why do bodybuilders still use body part splits? There's a little bit of a myth going on here that splits are always ineffective. Not true when you apply the right kind of methodology to split training, your body will respond. We talk about it in this episode. The next question was, what are the best ways to keep track of progress? This particular individual is working out. uh, Their their weights are going up. They're eating healthy, but the weight on the scale isn't changing, so they're feeling unmotivated. The final question, this person finds that it's uh, it's hard to be confident without being self-depreciating or... How do you become confident without being cocky? What is the difference between the two? We give answers on that question. Because, we're so bad at this. Because we're so good <laughs> no, at being we're not. cocky. We're awesome. Exactly. Also, this month, now we did mention in the episode our intuitive nutrition guide. We also talked about fasting. Well, we have guides on nutrition and fasting. Both are available for free this month if you enroll in any MAPS bundle. Now, bundles are we take multiple MAPS programs. And we combine them and discount them by like 20 or 30% off. For example, we have a super bundle, which is a year of exercise programming. It's like five, four or five MAPS programs put together. It's the superest. Designed by Adam, Justin, and myself. So you go through each program. By the time you're done with all of them, it's a year later and you look amazing. Enroll in that or any other bundle. Get the fasting guide and the nutrition guide for absolute free if you go to mindpumpmedia.com. T-shirt time! And it's T-shirt time. Oh, yeah. Good chow! All right, we have 13 reviews this last week. Oh, that's low. And four winners. The winners are Celeste Carp, Jess 17123789, okay. Reggie Aloha, and Big Dong. No, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, thanks, Doug. <laughs> Big Don Ding Dong. Big Don Wait a minute. Ding Dong. Did Doug just have a Freudian uh, slip? Yeah. Yeah. No, it's Big Don Ding Dong. Well, it Not is Big about Dong. as Ding Dong. Say though. that fast seven yeah. times. Yeah. All right. In order to get your T-shirt, you must email iTunes at mindpumpmedia.com, send your shirt size, your shipping address, and also include the name I just read. By the way, our West Coast tour is coming up, and we still have some spots available so you can actually sign up show up for free meet adam justin and myself ask us questions have a great time you might get some free gifts the first one is may 10th in encinitas 
The second one is May 18th in Seattle. If you want to sign up, go to mindpumpmedia.com forward slash tour. Hurry up and do it now. And put the www in, otherwise you will not get the correct link. Thanks, Doug. Is Stussy making a comeback? Stussy, yeah! Stussy is not- I didn't even realize that. I remember that shit back in the day. So Stussy has made uh, more than just a comeback. In fact, last year they reported the the largest earnings they've had since they've been in in business. Since ever? Since ever. Dang! Because they were big in the- they when we were, were kids, right? Don't call to come back. Bro, there's a, uh, a lot of a lot of brands have made a comeback. It's been really interesting to watch. So Champion, uh, Fila, oh, sorry, Stussy. Sorry, I mean, Champion Stupid. was in Kmart. Like when I was a kid, if you wore Champion, you were broke. Right? It wasn't yeah. cool. Or now it's fucking cool. So Champion has mm. made a comeback, which is crazy to me. Talk about a cocky name, though, huh? Right. Champion. <laughs> yeah. Fila. I'm wearing champion because okay. I am. Remember, uh, Fila had it had its run back when we were kids. Shit, our first uniform at Twenty Four Hour Fitness was was uh, oh affiliated with Fila. Fila. I never liked Fila. Come on. Yeah, so I actually bought some Fila yeah, pants. This you don't like Fila? No, it's stupid. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when I was a kid, I thought Fila was Phils because uh, it looks like an S at the end, a cursive S. <laughs> I was like Phils. Yeah. No, so, Fila. so the the talk of the town right now is the the new song. Uh, I think it's made in America by uh, Childish Gambino. The uh, uh, the Danny, what's his name? That's Danny. the one you just showed us. Yeah, Danny yeah. Glover, or uh, he's a comedian, right? Yeah, and that I he's mean, playing it, Lando in uh, the new. Yeah, man. Solo I mean, film. He's definitely. Oh, is his, he really? Yes. Yeah, he's oh, I, yes, oh I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah they didn't. actually approached him. Well, a lot of his fans wanted him to be the next Spider Man, and then that one didn't happen. So I'm glad that he got the role actually for Lando. He's God, like, he's perfect. He for looks it. great for it. Yeah. He looks just like him. Yeah, he's a funny guy, like too. He, so I, this, this, I mean, you just showed me the video, and this was a pretty deep. <laughs> topic right right no i know he's i know he's addressing the the recent uh shooting by of what stephan clark in sacramento that just happened not that long ago so i know it's it, there's lines in there that he's addressing that definitely heavy man that's yeah, a, very heavy uh very artsy i thought it was fucking super creative uh-huh. um to to do something like that i like for the most part i like stuff like this for mm-hmm. the most part mm-hmm. but i also see the other side of it too I also think sometimes it feeds into uh, this separation thing. Mm-hmm. And that, that I, that's the part I don't like about it. I, I appreciate it, and I'll, t- I'll tell you why I appreciate it. It's it's uh, in an artistic expression. It's nonviolent. Mm-hmm. So you know, I, I well, I, except in the video. Well, I mean, <laughs> but I mean, real. Violent, I mean, yeah. real violence. It's right, not right, real right, violence. Right, like right. you know, it, he's speaking against it. I mean, yeah, yes, but, yes, yeah. Yes. And I, I appreciate that. Even if I disagree with someone's you know opinion, I really appreciate it when someone can express themselves in mm-hmm. a way that can get uh, can make an impact or at least get people to start talking. Because here's what I got from the video. It 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 looks like he was showing two sides. Like one side is the facade the smiles the you'll make money Dancing go whatever and yeah and then the other side was harsh reality of uh of you know violent culture or violent societies that we see or, vo- or violent you know subcultures or sub societies that we see within america which you know uh, they it need they need to get voiced out people need to keep talking about them yeah you see a lot of i mean in the, in the political climate you see a lot of saying things to, that you know or like there's a lot of entertainment that sort of distracts america with when we're overseas and there's like all this stuff happening and like shootings and you know uh, you know we're assassinating people but it's like you know th- then right back to the dancing and singing and entertainment you know and so it's like it, it's kind of showing that like crazy contrast that we're just it's almost like it's it's one of those you're asleep and we need to wake up kind of a message. Yeah, I appre- I appreciate it. I don't know if I um I have to watch it more times to really kind of break it down and see what he's trying to communicate, but I appreciate that it's that music has that they're, they're doing it through music or they're they're doing it in a way that cuz there's like 18 million views you said in 2 days. Yeah, and it's number one trending in like, in like twenty different countries right now. So it's ex- it's exploding right now. This is only what a night, one day old. It's- this is what I see. This is what music. Back in the day, this was what music did. Music it was, still was does. Controversial when you, when you say that, you sound so old, bro. It still does it. Well, it's, it's, music still does it. Yes, you know what it is. Yes, it still does. It, you know what it is. You just are unaware no, 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 of it. No, no, I'm no, trying no. to help you no, become no, aware no, no, of it. No, 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 no. It's not the same, dude. 
If you, and here's why, because of course it's not the same. You it's had different. A, it's you, different times. No, not because it's different music, but because you had a, a very strong counterculture mm. in the past, and today there isn't that same counterculture. That's what I mean. Really? There's a lot more. Yeah, there's a lot more. Well, I think music now that's just for you know fun and games. I think there's stuff. more reason now to have like uh, you know to bring to light a lot of the issues because like. It's interesting when you see everybody like in this sort of unrest state, what kind of music comes out of it. And I think that you're going to be seeing a lot more of this where, you know, people are going to kind of bring up um, a lot of the problems through their music and expression. And this is what artists do in, in, in times like these. So, Well, there, there's always going to be real artists and then there's always going to be people that are writing trends. It's just part of it, and there's and there's ways to make money and business out of that, and that that goes across all things, not yeah. just music. That goes into fashion, goes into everything else. There's going to be people. This song will get politicized for sure, though. Oh, it, with yeah. the title like "This Is America," and then showing in the video, you know, all the killing and stuff like that. It, that'll well, get it'll get politicized. You'll get one side that's going to say, "Oh, we're such a violent culture and society, and it's terrible, and America sucks." You get the other side that says, "How dare you say that about?" You know this great country, and everyone's going to get offended. And uh, but well, you know what? I like that. I like that. Yeah, like, it creates talk. discussion, yeah. and that's right. the reason why I brought it up. And that's why too, I feel like I, I kind of feel both sides of it. I love it, but then I also can see too where it could feed into that part where now everyone's going to be like, "Oh, it's so terrible here. It's so bad." It's like, well, no, we've discussed this on the show before. It's less violent today than it was ten years and yeah. twenty years and thirty years ago. It is. So it is. We are we are evolving in the better direction, and we are becoming a safer, better mm -hmm. uh, country. But I think. Too, but there are areas. There are segments you know within this country that are extremely dangerous like you, like you go to certain parts of chicago certain parts of los angeles you know i could go down the list of cities where and they're massive cities and very very big big cities like that always tend to have more violence and america has more of these big metropolitan type areas than any other you know western nation but some of these cities are very dangerous some of them have, have body counts that are like war zones and you know you, you gotta like we had to do something, you know. Yeah. You know, it's funny. New York, New York City used to have, used to be very violent. It used to have a terrible track record, um, and then they they came out with some policies that were controversial, but did a fucking good job. They did a good job, and you have way less crime there. What did they come out that was controversial? Oh, it was just aggressive policing. You know what I mean? It was uh, stop and, and and frisk you if they suspected you had something on you. It was a lot of cops, way more cops. It was. Just a, a stronger police presence, and uh, you know they. What's his name? Who was the guy that uh, he ran for president too? Giuliani. Uh, uh, yeah. I'm sorry, Mayor Giuliani. Yes, Giuliani was the guy that that, that he ran for president all. one time. I didn't know that. Yeah, well, he ran for the Republican primary to mm. to, to become the Got the it. candidate on the Republican side, and um, his his approach was was very. I mean, he's got police background, right? It was like we're going to clean up the streets, and so. They made sure there were no broken windows. There was no graffiti. I mean, his his approach was if the city looks cleaner, then there's going to be less crime. Didn't they take it, out a lot of the porn uh, yep. industry? Like, yep. yeah, the, the presence as far as like downtown and stuff. He had a heavy hand. You know, he he had a heavy hand, and uh, in New York, the crime rate did drop quite a bit, but there was a lot of. Um, He's a, lot of controversy. he's a very polarizing person, isn't he? He's, oh, he's yeah. got a lot of people that love and hate him, right? New Yorkers tend to like him, but yeah, you're right. Yeah. And part of it was because of some of those policies. Part of it was, you know, there was more tension in the minority areas of, of New York City because they would feel like they'd get stopped a lot and frisked and all that stuff. And um, now, and then, of course, his argument was, well, you know, go in your your neighborhood's like, you know, one third of the violent as violent as it was before, so it's working. And then they'd say, well, we don't like being treated this way, whatever. So it was very controversial, but crime-wise, it did it did make a big difference. And it's it's a tough situation. Like, what do you do with some of these cities? Like, how, what's your approach? You know, what, one thing that always works is more police. That's a statistic that's down down just a hundred percent. You increase the police presence, and crime tends to tends to drop. Right. So that's the biggest one. That but Which you know, always that makes me uncomfortable. <laughs> you know, a lot of times it's just like, wow, we had, you know. It, it, at the same time, like you know that like there is police presence there, so it deters a lot of crime that potentially. But uh, just I don't know. I'm always like thinking of like the military state and like yep. you know all that kind of stuff. Yeah, that that too. always weighs on me. So yeah, I'm it, the same it is. Way. It's a tough. It's a tough. Um, compromise, right? It is, it is. But um, but no, I, I I appreciate 
music like this and that kind of commentary because however if it invokes a feeling in you that makes you want to talk mm-hmm. and discuss and in and, and debate then good yeah i think that's a great thing no, yeah I, I think so too i think yeah. I, I mean fuck it's doing it already it's incredible the the movement it's getting on it right now yeah. just be it'll be interesting to see how it washes itself out and what, what comes of it mm-hmm. afterwards because sometimes too like i said it can it's also going to provoke that extreme side too, which right. is uh, that always concerns me with something like still this. Still kind of polarizes and pulls people apart, but it definitely still presents that there's a lot of work that we need to do. Right, you know? exactly. Gets, yeah. I think the positive things, I think it's extremely artsy. I think it definitely gets people talking. I think the drawbacks is it could also separate us somewhat too. So I think that's what you always have to worry about. And that's the thing. As long as people can sit down and try to understand the other person – and talk, we're good. If it's in this, if we get stuck in this situation where it's yelling and then hate and then you don't understand me, I don't, you know, I don't understand you, fuck you, then you're screwed. But if we can sit, I told you about this, the the study that they did a while ago where they they uh, had a bunch of people on on polar opposite sides of the political spectrum, and the more that that person knew about the other side the less likely they were to view them as evil, ignorant, mm-hmm. stupid. You know, the, the less likely they were to view them as not a person. You know what I mean? And, and Which obviously, that's obvious. Like when you understand the other side and try – because what you have to think about is, of course there's people that are just irrational. Of course that, that, that exists. Of course there's people that are just ridiculous. But when you have a lot of people feeling a particular way, and however ridiculous and irrational you think they are and there's, a, there's enough of them – Try to understand why they may have that senti- sentiment, and you'll you, you can find some empathy and maybe make your point better, or sometimes change your mind. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. But when you have you know people saying stuff like this about, because I tend to when I hear a lot of the stuff about you know policing, and uh, you know how cops may be you know treating people in, in particular minorities, you know I I also feel empathy for the police officers, but then I try and put my mi- myself in the in the uh, you know in the mind and body of a person who's complaining about this stuff and imagine living in that kind of a neighborhood where maybe you do have a lot of neighbors that are doing a bunch of crazy shit and maybe cops are in, in bad situations and maybe I'm a good guy but now I got to live in this real reality where they don't know if I'm a good guy and you know mm-hmm. one of their buddies almost just got shot at yesterday so now I'm going to get treated like like and, and how's that going to make me feel and if I'm a young kid mm-hmm. I might not even understand as well I might just fucking start hating somebody have you guys ever been pulled over by a police officer and been treated like really aggressively has that ever happened to you uh i had it as a kid when i was in high school when i used to drive this lowered integra that was you know had the stereo system going and i used to get pulled over like weekly Mm -hmm. all the time now did you did you ever get like pulled out of the car well no i yeah no they've had me step out of the car and stuff like that yeah they've had but i never got i mean they didn't slam me against the hood and i also did i was scared you know i resisted you know i'm saying i'm not i would i didn't mouth off or anything like that but i definitely felt harassed 100% 100% I felt harassed. Do you remember how you, did you change, did you, how did you feel after that? Like, yeah, did, I hated cops. Yeah. 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 I had an attitude towards cops for mm-hmm. sure. I Isn't that weird? So we have, we have a tendency to, because it's funny, that the same people that's that also say, That's also my childish mind though too. I, oh, I, I'm also a grown adult now that when I see something like that, I like, I don't, I don't think like that at all anymore. But I was a kid, you know what I'm saying? As a kid and you, again, this is. This is how our brain works and processes. Yeah, I was just going to say that. You, 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 you pull me over every single week for no reason, you know what I'm saying, or just fucking with me because my exhaust is loud or my stereo system or I look like a profile or whatever like that. Now I, 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 see that, I see that happen to me multiple times. So the next time a cop pulls me over, instantly I think I'm being harassed. It's, it's, it's just a reality. Because, right. It, it's a reality that people get pissed off at because it's an unfortunate reality. But it's a real reality. And you have to understand this. The brain... Does a very human brains do a very good job at identifying patterns. In fact, your brain is always trying to identify patterns, and because of how we evolved, say better safe than sorry is is typically what our brains will default to. So there may be a pattern that has no use whatsoever, but your brain's always going to make you. It's always going to put you in the position to better safe than sorry. So yeah, you might this might be a bad decision, but we're gonna we're being wrong this many uh, with this thing. Every single time is more likely to make you safe. So I'll give you an example. If if I get assaulted by a person wearing a plaid jacket, okay, four, five, six times, 
I'm my brain's going to create an association with plaid jackets. Right. As ridiculous as that sounds, logically, as stupid as that sounds, I will react. You're hate lumberjacks. I, yeah, I'm going to react to a, to a plaid jacket. You it's know, in a subconscious it's our, way. It's how our brains work. That's right, and it's because it's that better safe than sorry. So. If you look a particular way, if you dress a particular way, if you're a cop and you hate cops and maybe you got pulled over and harassed, now when you see a cop, that's going to be your that's going to be how you're going to feel and it's important to say one, that's real. It's a real thing that our brains do this. So stop what I hate is when people say shit like, "Well, I'm colorblind. Well, I'm not I don't discriminate." What? Well, well, okay, here's the bottom line is everybody does. Your brain does. The, the key is to know that you do. Right. Then you can ab- mm-hmm. observe it and then be okay and then uh, Re- fix it. Readjust it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, but real if, you, time. if you pretend like, no, 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 I don't, I don't. Well, that's bullshit. Of course you do. You, you, you see differences all the time. Your brain's always trying to make yeah. patterns. It's just baloney. So, it, so be honest and say, okay, I probably do discriminate based on whatever my brain decides because of my experiences yeah. in my life and media. But then being aware of that, now I can step back and be like, wait a minute, am I feeling it, there's a cop next to me right now, at the, you know, at the stoplight, and I'm feeling like really anxious and stressed, you know. But maybe I shouldn't be, right? Maybe he just he's a different person than the one guy that pulled me over and slammed me on the hood. I, I've had that happen before. Where I got mm-hmm. I did a burnout. And I think what the cop was doing, he was trying to teach me a lesson. Is what I think he was doing. But I was with my girlfriend, my cousin, and his girlfriend in the back. I did a burnout at a stoplight. And then I took off, and I didn't see there must have been a police officer in, in one of the side streets. He pulls me over, and another cop pulls in front. So I had two, two police officers around me, and he and he rolls my I roll my window down, and he's like, "Do you know why I pulled you over?" And I played stupid. I'm like, "No," and he's like, "Get the fuck out of the car!" And it was like from then on, it was he ripped me out of the car, threw me on the hood, helped put my hands behind my back, handcuffed me, put me back on the hood, and he's like lecturing me. And the other cops are standing outside my car, like keeping. And I was like 17 years old, oh. so for a few years after, when I'd see a yeah. cop, I was like, Fuck "Well, you, I've shared the story on here where my pa- my parents called the cops. I mean, they had me arrested in my living room. I was crying and shit like that, and then I had to sit in the back of a cop car for like fucking two hours. So, absolutely, I did not like cops like growing up. But again, that was because of my experiences yep. that I had with it. Now, as an adult, I've met many of guys that serve that are fucking incredible, dude, incredible men and women. And so I think that's important to always... It's Your brain is is designed to do that. It's the awareness factor that I think that you have to realize. And then sometimes I feel like people just shut that off. They just you know assume because of their experiences because five out of six times I've had a bad experience with this quote unquote type of people mm-hmm. therefore they're all bad it's like mm-hmm. that's terrible and, because- and some t- sometimes you know it's also okay to admit that some patterns may may actually it's gonna be controversial but they may actually show you that there's a higher likelihood of some shit mm-hmm. like for example you just said you had a car was slammed down to the ground lowered right. tinted windows loud exhaust loud music you know, that tends to be the vehicle of kids that right. tend to do shit. Well, no, exactly. If you take that that vehicle, right, and that's what I understand now as an adult, and you go 10 of those vehicles, and then you go 10 Toyota yeah. Camp 1990 <laughs> Toyota Camrys, you know, with a, with a car seat or in the back. Or minivans. Right, or a minivan, you know, who does the cop pull over? Yeah. Nine times out of 10, he's going to pull over me and my, and, and so I could get angry about that, or I could say, well, I did put myself in this category of, you know, more likely to do that, and so all I can do is be respectful and hope to God that I have somebody who pulls me over who is also respectful. That's right, of me, that's right. so. Yeah, I went through that. Yeah, I was going to Chipotle actually with my boys, and uh, there was this this guy who was like kind of sitting out, uh, homeless guy who was like you know fidgeting and and saying like crazy stuff. And like I was walking by, and just like immediately I'm like, no, you know, we're gonna avoid this guy, this character. I don't know, like it's just unpredictable. You know, it's yeah. these, these things that run through your mind. Like my my kids were just playing, and they're like walking almost like right in front of him, and he's just. Rah! And, you know, it's just, it's those things that like, you're like, okay, I don't know, like necessarily what this guy's going through. Like, maybe he's just like going to be nice and just ask for change or whatever. But like, for me, it was like, no, like I just predictively, I'm going to move over. I'm going to go to the side. So it's like, sometimes, you know, like it, it, it serves you yeah. in a certain way. So you have to be kind of conscious of just that. Just know that it happens. Yeah. It happens. You know what I mean? Then you, then you can start working with it. Don't pretend like it yeah. didn't happen though. I know. That's reality. Since we're on the controversial, uh, tip here uh do you guys know his birthday it was over the weekend yeah i saw you put carl, carl, carl marx <laughs> can you believe that there's people that are actually in in europe in particular um and some people in america who actually celebrate 
uh, Karl Marx's birthday and have we'll have parades and shit. And in in Karl Marx's birthplace in Germany, I can't remember the name of the town, they enacted a statue of Karl Marx, which was gifted to Germany, this town, excuse me, by the Chinese, of course, communist Chinese. So, fuck, what the fuck? Makes me so mad. How- you know what makes me mad about this? Here's what makes me mad. This is and this is an interesting point. And in, in, uh, w- when I make it, you guys will uh, you guys will understand. Oh, that's right. The town is Trier, T R I E R, whatever. So, if you see a guy, you know, waving a a swastika, right? He, most likely, he's gonna get he's gonna get attacked. He's either gonna get attacked, or people are gonna like you, you know, in society and outside or whatever. If if someone was doing this outside, you're gonna be shunned for having a swastika on. Or for for saying Hitler was a great guy or whatever or, or fascism, right? Most people are going to be like "fuck you," whatever. Yeah. If you have a hammer and sickle flag, the 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 flag of the Soviet Union, some people will look at you like you're an asshole, but a lot of people will be like, "whatever, not a big deal." The they're both they were both extremely murderous, extremely. But communism is actually better in that category in the sense that they've killed far more people. Some by us, some estimates over a hundred million people died under the idea of Karl Marx. I still see people wearing shirts sometimes with a car, with Karl Marx on them or you know or Che Guevara or whatever. And these people were responsible for you know Karl Marx's philosophies killed over 100 million people in the 20th century, but people don't freak out about it and I think or a lot of people don't get so uh, appalled by it. And I think it's because the what are we glorifying? It's romanticized. About, what, yeah, what is what is it about him that people are Oh well, if you if you read his books, you know he's the his philosophies are what created you know socialism and and and, uh, and communism, and it was eliminate the classes. It was that capitalist will uh, will exploit the workers. It was that you know every it's basically the ideas behind uh, communism. Everybody's equal. Um, they push equality of outcome rather than equality of opportunity, and that's the big 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 difference between Marxist philosophy and capitalism or free market uh, philosophy or what they would call classical liberal uh, philosophy, which is classical liberals believe in the sovereignty of the individual and that, uh, that you know, the government exists to, pr- to ensure equality of opportunity. Now, where you end up is up to you. That's, that's your choice. Communism or Marxist mentality is about equality of outcome. So, r- doesn't matter where you start at the end we're all going to end the same okay and so you can see how it's it can be uh, alluring that meant that that philosophy like oh that sounds that sounds good that sounds mm-hmm. like you know it can work out but every time we've ever tried to apply that philosophy where we try to make everybody equal on the outcome it results in well you have to force people that's the that's a that, that's that's the biggest problem. Like you can't <laughs> you can't do that with like all the nice intentions in the world aren't gonna you know fix the fact that you have to force people to all be the same. You do, and people aren't the same. No, in, in fact, they don't want to be the same. No, no, I don't want to be the same as everybody else. That's right. Like maybe I want a lot of money. Maybe you don't want a lot of money. Maybe I want to live uh, you know a life where. You know, I, I live very basic and simple and whatever. Maybe you want to live a very complicated, you know, life. Maybe you want to work real hard and I don't find it that important, you know? Yeah. And that's the that's the the that's the main problem with it is that there's a lot of force that goes on. The other problem with it is economically speaking, it's so inefficient because they try to essentially plan everything. And you can't be effective with or efficient with resources when you're trying to essentially plan an entire country. There's so many moving parts. And this is why you had you know fields of wheat that would go rotten in the Soviet Union because they were just so inefficient, yeah. and why the U.S. ended up with you know obesity instead of starvation. So, uh, but I can't believe people s- celebrate that shit. He was a that's crazy. His philosophies were just terrible. I, saw, I saw that pop up. Just need a history lesson. I think. I, I think I don't think you can even I don't even think it matters. It doesn't matter. You just <laughs> no. ignore it. <laughs> How the fuck can it's crazy? It was the 20th century, dude. It wasn't that long ago. Yeah. You know, actually, you still have communist countries you still have places like china now that are you know yeah they definitely implement capitalism far more than the soviets did but they're by no means free and um god they, there's a lot of shit that goes on there too especially now with all that how they're tracking their citizens you yeah. know did you oh, guys yeah. did either one of you guys watch any of the nba finals this week or the, the 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 playoffs at all no none no. neither one of you sorry so they i thought this was kind of cool it's funny it was right around the same time that you had posted that on your insta story the carl marx i was going through your thing 
um, and I'd just written down this to, to bring up to you guys. I wanted to bring it up on the TV so you guys could see it. It's uh, Doug, could you Google uh, NBA mental health? I thought this was pretty cool um, that the NBA is taking this on right now. They had a really cool commercial with Kevin Love and uh, D Rosa from um, the Raptors who uh, spoke out. There it is. Uh, D Rosen, sorry. Um, they talked about mental health and anxiety and depression and things mm. like that. And so the NBA is partnering up. Um, who are they partnering up with? I forget who they're to attack mental uh, mental health, and they're going to be. Doing, is there like an issue in the NBA with people? I, I think it's less about that. There's an issue in the NBA. It's just that that there's even these rich NBA stars that actually are dealing with this, some of these issues that are. I mean, we we talk about on the show all the time, right? But this is there's this growing epidemic of anxiety, depression, mm -hmm. and suicide, and all these things like that. Mm -hmm. And so kind of a cool thing seeing the NBA tackle it and the way that they're tackling it. I thought they had a really well, cool... Well, it's great because, it, I mean, kids still idolize and these yeah, are right. all their heroes. So to have them voicing, you know, a lot of these uh, big, big issues that everybody's going through. These so that, days I think great. that's how it all started. So I, these two players, both Kevin Love and uh, DeRozan, had tweeted something not that long ago uh, just in regards to their anxiety and stress and depression and stuff and they openly shared it mm. and then it kind of went gangbusters like people were talking all about it and then the nba ends up partnering with them and they're doing this whole mental health campaign so dude i feel the nba is really really like forward thinking and fuck and, yeah they and, are. and compared to like the rest of uh sports like even with football it's like yeah they they address the fact that there's problems right there's like cte there's all these like but but it's always I don't know. It's centered around like how can we fix like the symptoms of, of, you know, like how this is all happening. And then they're trying to kind of almost it feels like they're trying to sweep it kind of under the rug and, and like move forward where the NBA is doing a really good job of like, you know, OK, let's think Proactive. ahead. Yeah. Proactively think about how we can address big issues. So well, that's I think really if, you're, cool. if you're the NFL, you want to. You want to work on things, but you don't want to be too vocal about it because <laughs> it's going to hurt just, your business. Yeah, you're bringing more. It would be like the, you know, like the cigarette industry, like openly spending money to help people getting lung cancer from their product. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, well, you see, I mean, there's there's violent, you know, domestic violent issues. There's yeah. there's there's just so many big issues in, in football specifically that they should. I felt they could have done a way better job addressing and you know, really being proactive with it, with where I, I see other, you know, like with NBA and, mm -hmm. and baseball. Really, tackling. I think there's there's two main issues because, you know, mental health, there's definitely a, a bit of an epidemic that's happening with mental health, in particular with the, with the youth. When, when you looked, when we saw those statistics on from that book, uh, I, I think it was iGen, iGeneration, um, where you see kids, like suicide rates and stuff and depression among kids seems to be exploding. And I think there's a couple reasons. One is everybody's gut health is seems to be a lot worse. And mm -hmm. we're now the more we learn about the gut, the more we realize what an impact that has on the physical health of your of your brain. And so it's important to understand too when you have mental health issues, there's a physical component many times, um, which is you know you're not producing enough neurotransmitters or there's inflammation systemically or inflammation in the brain, which can make you physically feel depressed or physically feel anxious. Mm -hmm. And when you get that physical feeling of depression, what happens is you then try to mentally, you know, you're thinking, why am I depressed? Why do I feel so shitty? And then whatever issues you have in your life, which everybody has issues in their life, everybody has stuff they can stress about, you can start to make, that starts to make become bigger now because now I'm looking at it like, and it feels so much worse because I'm already physically depressed. So now that I'm stressed out about whatever, now it seems like a much bigger issue and then that can start to spiral. And then you also have the, you know, everything's physically okay with me, but there's that, you know, that mental component of, and I just think it's just people don't feel fulfilled. Mm -hmm. We have more stuff, way more stuff than we ever have. We have more money than we've ever had. Well, I feel like it's isolating too, you know, on top of that, since we have so much stuff and you could isolate, you know, yourself in your room and be distracted by electronics. And you know, so you, you compile all these factors, right? You have your gut health, 
you have lack of sun, you have this isolation where you're not like in communication with somebody person to person where you can really discuss things that are going on with your life. And it's not, you're not really having a personable, um, conversation with somebody anymore. It's all like virtually. And, and you're just, you're just sort of like, uh, pulling yourself away from, um, community. People are, um, they're searching, they're searching for something that all of us want, which is that feeling of like, of meaning, you know, the fulfillment, but they're, but the things that they're trying to fill that with aren't things that can give you that. And so what they're doing is they're using technology or drugs or food or sex or all these things that temporarily feel good, but they won't, they won't fulfill that. They won't, they won't fill that up. I was watching this, uh, this talk by this uh, YouTube uh, priest. He's actually really, really good. Whether you're religious or not, he's really good. His name is Bishop Barron. And he's talking about uh, spiritual health, which I'm starting to understand now um, what, what that kind of means. And he's saying how, you know, there's a, there's a, a void within p- humans that we need to fill, and it's with spiritual love and spiritual health. But if you try to fill that hole with things that are not from that or or not spiritual, so if you try to fill that with drugs or money or sex or food or your work or whatever, that you'll find that that hole is is bottomless. It's a bottomless pit and you'll keep, and that's where you get that dysfunction. That's where you get addiction. That's where you get where people start to worship money because money is not evil, but if you start to worship it, then definitely you, you, you start to develop problems. And so I think that's part of it too. I think people are just... You know, you ask people like, "What's your what's your meaning?" And you know, I don't know. I think you're on the right track with the we're we're heading in this society, and we talk about this with the 3D printer down the road and so that is people real soon here are going to be able to have anything and everything like instantly. And I think that the the more readily available that becomes, the more you think that that should provide this happiness or this fulfillment you're talking about, and they're not getting it. And you see it all the way at the top where you're talking about superstar athletes that are making mm-hmm. millions of dollars that are still dealing with the depression, the anxiety, and all this mental health. Like You got to think to yourself, if you don't have meaning, like if there's not something that's like worth it for you, then nothing's worth it. And what I mean by that is like, you know, life's going to get hard, challenging, always for anybody. I don't care who you are. There's going to be challenges. If you don't have something that gives you meaning, then as you go through these difficult things, you're going to keep, you're going to continue feeling like, what's the point? You know, I have a friend of mine who actually she was my very, very, very first client when I opened up my, my wellness studio. She's a personal trainer now. And when I first started training her, um, you know, she was kind of a little uh, standoffish and we ended up becoming very good friends. And I learned that two years prior to me training her, she lost her son when he was 18 years old. Terrible. Hmm. Terrible, terrible. And every time she would bring, you know, we started talking about it, I could tell she was obviously still, it was very, very painful. But as I got to know her later and later, She was able to open up more about it. And I asked her, you know, uh, what was that like, you know, doing that? Because I have two kids and, uh, you know, I I can't even, just imagining if something bad happened to my kids can ruin an entire day. I can't even imagine if something actually happened. And she said, well, it was my other kid because she had a daughter also. And she said, you know, when you lose, when something like that, that bad happens to you, you feel like, like nothing is worth anything anymore. You're, you know, you've, you've lost all meaning in life, except I had another child. And so then my meaning became, I need to be good and strong for my daughter so she can make it through this. And that was the meaning that pulled her through. And so when you're going through challenging times, you have to find a reason or purpose. Otherwise, you start to feel like, why? It'd be like working out, getting real sore, sweaty for nothing, for no result. You get fatter, you're not getting in shape or whatever. It's the same reason why people stop working out when they start to see no progress or no results. It's kind of like that. You need to have that meaning and that purpose. And I think a lot of people don't. They don't have that, especially kids, because they're... I think Justin touched on a really important point, too, that you made about the community thing, because I, I see this a lot right now in our space, um, that I wasn't prepared for this or didn't think this until I saw it firsthand, which is a lot of these people that have created a large presence on you know Instagram or podcasting or Facebook or whatever their celebrity status is through social media... Um, really don't have a lot of human interaction. Mm-mm. Like they're incredible on their Insta story and, and and on on the podcast or on their YouTube or whatever. And they literally spend so much time on that every day to provide for their fans. And and they and I think they justify that as their human interaction because you're talking to millions of people and you're responding to comments. 
but they don't have any real like social interaction in person. Part of the reason why I'm really excited about this whole touring thing that Taylor has set up for us and heading down to Viore and getting out there with real people and talk to people. People just don't do that anymore. Yeah, that was something. If, if if you wanted to grow your brand, your band, or whatever, or your celebrity status, as you were, you know, twenty years ago, like you hit the fucking road. Oh yeah, you, you had, had to make physical presence. Yes, you you had to do that. We live in an era now where that's not necessary. In mm-hmm. fact, it's that is the old way or the slow way of doing things because I could reach. I mean, it's way faster for us to reach people on YouTube, email, Facebook, the podcast than it is to go down, fly all the way down to San Diego to maybe see a hundred people or so in person. Like that's, it's, you know, so the average person I think today that's building a business that's on a platform like we are, doesn't see a lot of value in that because they know they can make way more headway doing it just on, on these platforms. But you also lose the part that I think is so important, which is that social interaction. And I think that's something that's dying. And mm-hmm. I also think that it's feeding into this this whole mental health. Yeah, issue. but I, I think uh, I think they're gonna, people will start understanding you need to do that. You know what I mean? You need to go out and meet people because the odds of you getting 2 million followers on Instagram and building a business off that are slim to none. Mm-hmm. The odds that you can build an audience of a few thousand people that really like what you have to say and really, you know, you really connect with are much higher. But in order to do that, you got to touch, you got to reach out and touch people. You got to go and meet with people. You got to make real impressions on people. It won't happen just through, you know, you know, tech. It, it typically won't. You got to meet, like when we meet people at these uh, conventions that we go to, you know that they leave, you know, feeling an even deeper connection to us because they met us, they shook our hand, they got to talk to us, get to hang out and with us. And vice versa. Yeah. I mean, it, yes. it it really it really affected me just seeing people and, and like what they've gotten from, you know, some of our shows in person and, and like, um, you know, their stories, especially like what they've, what they've gone through and then ha- that they can express that, um, you know, in person. It makes such a more of a powerful impact, which then affects how we talk on the show. Bro, you cried. Imagine, I imagine. I mean, talk about you're talking about fulfillment and feeding your soul and the spiritual mm-hmm. side, things like that. Like that would not happen had you not been in person to see and look in the eyes of another person that you've made an impact in. Like that's just that's important. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that that's important to mental health. I think that's something that we're we're losing that importance of this connection to people in real life. It's really a, it's a, it's. It's scary, and then it's also like I I believe in humanity. I believe that we'll push the limits so far, and then eventually how we learn, dude. Yeah, it is how we yeah. learn, you know. So, and those that are, I think, those that see it and and can be aware of it, you know, use these things as tools, but then also be aware of where it, the path that it could head down to, and then I think you can be all right. You know, there's no substitute for the real thing. No, you know what I mean. But there are things that can that can improve Sounds upon like a Pepsi commercial. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> was that Coke? I don't know. It was one of those. One two. of those things. Anyway, so this weekend I did my fast. My annual. Oh, my, you did your three monthly. day. Yeah. So no, I do. I go forty eight to seventy two. I did forty eight this time. Um, but uh, it's that once a month fast, and every time, man, I swear to God, I come out of it, and I'm like sharp like a fucking laser now do you eat more now that you've been doing it so frequently or do you still really take a gradual approach in reintroducing it well no matter what i'm realizing that the first time i go to the bathroom post fast after i eat isn't going to be good (laughs) it's just it's weird it's because it's waking up my 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 system and then it's like evacuating you know what i'm saying (laughs) right so it's like okay I guess that's going to happen almost every time the first time. But no, I still do the, the bone broth. Uh, I'll do that and I'll wait a few hours. Then I'll have well, well-cooked well vegetables. And then I had uh, New York steak. Um, and then I had, a, I make this coconut dessert. I think I've told you guys this before. So I get the full fat coconut milk in the can mm-hmm. and I put it in the fridge so that it solidifies, like the fat part solidifies. And then I have one of those bullet blenders and I open the can and then I take out the the solidified part and then a little bit of the fluid that's in the can. Not all of it, because if you put all of it in, then it just becomes too liquidy. And I want it to be more like a like a custard, like a Do you mix custard. that with anything? Yeah. So I put it in a blender and I, I'll add as much fluid as I need to get it to kind of mix. And then I'll put in the uh 
uh, the gold juice from Organifi. Oh, that's a good call. So gold Ooh, juice. Oh, I bet that tastes like a dreamsicle. Right. right now. Remember exactly. those old orange popsicles? Yes. I tried to make that the other day with the or the gold juice, mm-hmm. and I overdid the. I used cocoa whip, and I think I overdid it. It was too sweet. The combination was of it? all. Uh, yeah. No, but I've did. been trying to make like an orange dreamsicle taste. Well, so it's great because the gold juice is great at night because it's got those relaxing you know properties. It's got horse tail in there. It's got. Lots of turmeric, which you know I've been taking a lot of. Mm -hmm. So I put that in there. I put the Organifi protein in there, chocolate, blended that up, and then me and the kids and Jessica. Oh, you did all that together, huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. blend it up, and it's like a custard, and it's it's because it's all coconut, full fat coconut milk. It's heavy, yeah. So you don't need to eat a lot. Like literally, if I ate four tablespoons of it and then I waited fifteen minutes, your appetite's. Oh wow! Yeah, Yeah, you're gone, dude, because you just ate. You know, twenty something, thirty grams of fat, <laughs> and it's a lot of medium chain triglycerides. Which post fast, I always go hard keto for anywhere between four to, to seven days to really get my ketones up. And so I like doing this because I notice it gets my ketones to go up a little higher because I do the P strip or whatever the mm. P test, and it's really fucking good. You know, I know we we promote fasting a lot on the show, but I have to say that I uh, it's getting out of control, man. I was at a, a barbecue this weekend, and actually fasting was like the topic, like all these. All, and it was all people that are really not into health and fitness. They <laughs> this are, one, is this for losing weight? <laughs> yes, it's uh, become the trendy oh, thing right now. It, I mean, it it's has- It's so funny, it's trending. That's old it's, school. Don't, it, don't need to lose weight. It is, <laughs> it is. And it's and the, the problem with it is what I see, the same problem that I see with the whole CP, CBD thing right now, is these we, we take a little bit of science and information- yeah. And then it turns into this dogmatic approach where everybody's trying it and doing it, oh, and they're the CBD lotions. Like I'm just gonna, I'm, I'm in pain. I'm gonna rub my CBD all over it. Yeah, dude. I, That's I just, like all I see now. It's crazy. It's and it's getting out of control with everybody doing. It. And I fasting has been doing. I mean, it's been popular for the last two years, but it, I thought it was kind of slowing down, and people were kind of moving over the keto way. But no, it's. It's accelerating. More and more people are using it. And everybody's doing it for the wrong reasons. They're doing it as a weight loss strategy. And every time I meet someone this, I try to explain to them, man, if that is your strategy to lose weight, it's going to be short-lived, man, because that intermittent fasting that you're doing right now, inevitably, you're probably going to stop doing that at one point, whether that be because you got to your goal finally or you never reached your goal. So you say, fuck it, you go back to eating like Mm -hmm. you were eating before. And now you've slowed your metabolism down. You've got your body used to not consuming mm-hmm. that much or that often. If you've got meta- metabolism issues, fasting is not a good idea. No. That's about, we have this friend of ours who keeps fasting, and I'm telling her, don't do it, dude, because you said you had a low resting metabolic rate. You're only going to make it you know, worse. Right. Um, now, occasional, it's not going to do that. And I don't like the consistent fasting. It doesn't work no, as well no. as the infrequent. Mm-hmm. You know, Like mine is once a month. That's what I'm doing. I used to do the almost every day, and this once a month option way, way superior than the way than than how my body felt I agree. before. But you know, I talked to Ruscio about fasting when we were in, in Paleo, and he said it seems to him, and he's a gut health expert, that people whose gut health issues revolve around their immune system, like they have a lot of auto, autoimmune issues or more autoimmune than other people, tend to do better with fasting than people who you know, or, or, or more mild. So if you have really bad gut issues and a lot of it has to do with the fact that you're, it's an autoimmune reaction, like food intolerances, he says that fasting's probably, that's probably why I'm experiencing such benefits from it. Mm. You know, I, I, there was a fasting study that, uh, came out that I wanted to read to you guys. I just posted it. This was done on mice and they found that a 24 hour fast dramatically improved the stem cells ability to regenerate in, in mice. And this is in their gut. So, uh, and this is an, this is an important thing to know because as you get older, your gut's cells ability to regenerate diminishes quite a bit, which is why as you get older, one of the reasons why as you get older, gut issues become more and more prevalent. I, me- I remember being a kid and hearing my grandfather talking about, you know, having a good poop and this and that. And I remember thinking like, stupid, who cares? But as you get older, you start to realize it becomes a bigger, you know, bigger and bigger deal. This may be one of the reasons. And so they did this with mice, and in 24 hours, I think it doubled the rate <clears throat> at which they regenerated. It's twice as fast. Isn't that it's like every <laughs> old man, like that's their favorite topic of conversation. Yeah, no. <laughs> it's like how well they poop today. Well, I think it's because they're all they're- forced to that. I mean, I think if I think what happens a lot right now in our age, I think there's a lot of people listening right now that ain't having good shits. 
Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And they're still getting <laughs> I know. and they're yeah. still getting by and they're, they're just fa- ignoring it. Right. Yeah. It's just ignoring it right now. It's like, uh, eh, so I had a rough shit today. You know what I'm saying? Shouldn't have had those <laughs> shouldn't have had those fire <laughs> Cheetos yesterday. You know what I'm saying? Like yeah. the, you know, note, note to self. It's so, like a machine gun. But you it's know, went off I mean, I know today. I was in my just my late twenties, I was like that. I mean, it was just, you know, if I had pizza or I had certain things in the diet that, you know, I I just didn't shit good or didn't feel good afterwards. But it's I don't know why it took me so long to really connect those dots of like, man, I just That's probably not a good thing. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's probably not a good thing if my body is responding this way. And and I think as you get much older, I think it becomes like necessary. And then you get locked up and then it's yeah. probably I mean, I'm sure <laughs> your, I'm your sure whole I, day revolves around. Well, right. If I'm experiencing shit, that, if I'm experiencing that in my late 20s and in my early 30s. Imagine, uh, I mean, if I kept going down that path, I can only imagine what 50 or 60 looks like with those shits. If I've had keep, clients, yeah. I've had clients in their 50s who take, would take medications to help them poop and then they'd take medications to prevent di- uh, diarrhea and they would, they would use them whenever anything would happen, sometimes in the same day. I remember having this mm-hmm. conversation with one of my clients where I looked at her medications and I'm like, this is for constipation, and this is one's for, for diarrhea, <laughs> and you're using these daily. And she's like, "Yeah." And I said, "Do you?" I said, "Do you see that one is like counteracting right. the other?" But that's what the doctor gave her. Oh, so, oh, God. if you have diarrhea, take this one. Oh, if you get constipated, take this one. Uh, here's every, an answer. Here's an answer. Yeah. They're and, just throwing pills. And out. you're just back yeah. and forth, back and forth. Uh, it's terrible. Yeah. Fucking terrible. That's crazy. You know. Fuck. This quaz brought to you by Organifi. For those days you fall short on getting your organic veggies or whole food nutrition, Organifi fills the gap with laboratory-tested certified organic superfoods to help give your health and performance the added edge. Try Organifi totally risk-free for 60 days by going to Organifi.com. That's O-R-G-A-N-I-F-I.com. And use the coupon code MINDPUMP for 20% off at checkout. Our first question is by Inspired to be Fit. Do you think that people who haven't had a hard life or hard upbringing are capable of becoming a successful entrepreneur? It seems like every person you guys interview has had some sort of life struggle that shaped them. What if you've had a good life? Oh, absolutely, I think. I mean, I, I bet though, I, there's got to be statistics around this, Sal. There's got to be yeah. something around that. The I, I actually think that somebody... Who, Raised in a really good home with lots of lots of I mean I've got friends and people that are successful because mom and dad set them up very well I mean yeah, they yeah. they gave them a quarter million dollars down on their down their house they gave them a hundred grand to start their first business it just doesn't fit the narrative with what is pushed out there a lot right like that's like the 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 underdog sort of overcoming so many odds and like everybody wants to hear that like serious struggle story it's less entertaining yeah right? yeah it's 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 less entertaining to hear somebody who had a safety net to fall back on it's less entertaining to hear somebody who mom and dad has helped them out all the way through and then eventually they hit it big and had a business but i mean i would argue that there's more of those and there actually are the people right. that yeah. are unsuccessful yeah, that is a that's what makes the story so I, good uh, yeah, yeah you're more likely to be successful if you have uh, a nice uh, a good upbringing and that doesn't mean by the way a good upbringing isn't that you have everything handed to you you. No. I think a lot of people think, oh, you're lucky you have everything handed right. to you. That actually creates bad uh, life patterns. It, be, it creates bad work ethic. It creates an understanding of life that's not accurate. And then when you go out and try things and you fail, you can't handle it. So a good upbringing would be stable home, you know, parents that love you, you know, support like that, you know, that kind of stuff. Opportunities. Y- you're not so poor that you can't do certain things. You have enough money to be able to do the things that you want to do. Statistically, statistics show that people in those situations tend to be more successful across the board. But we do hear a lot of the stories of the people who grew up extremely difficult mm-hmm. and that drove them to be extremely successful. It's a smaller percentage, but number one, we romanticize those stories because they're interesting. We like to hear those. It, likes, it makes us feel good to see that somebody yeah. could save themselves and become what they wanted. But I think there's another part to it. I think... If you have the right kind of person, the right kind of genetics, the right mix of genes, and a very, very hard life, sometimes that hard life turns that person, that mix, into a monster. Oh, of course. And it drives the fuck out of them. You know? It drives them in a way that, that, you know, I I tell you what, immigrants- arguably- 
arguably unhealthy, unhealthy, you know what I'm saying? Like, sure. Arguably, it, it drives them so much they become obsessive of it. I mean, I can connect to that. I can relate to um, not having things and wanting things so bad. It's a lot of what made me successful, but it also is what held me back too from realizing that there is more to life than just a, obtaining a, a certain level of financial success. So, you know, it's, I, I think that uh, Lewis Howes, when he talks about uh, the, the mask, I think does a really good job of explaining this is many times much of our success uh, that we have as adults is, or these masks that we've been wearing our whole life. So it's a, it's a double-edged sword, man. The entrepreneur life is, is a life of um, uncertainty and risk in comparison to the life that tends to be, because it's all, it's a, by the way, it's all uncertain. It's all, you know, there's a lot of, you know, chaos when you come out and try and do things on your own, but it feels more safe to do the, go to, you know, get, go to college, get it, go apply to get a job somewhere. It feels like that's more of a guaranteed path than somebody who leaves school and says, I'm going to do my own thing. Now, uh, statistics will show that people who try to do their own thing, if they stay at it um, and they work hard, they tend to do well, but they will also have failures along the way. So there's that. Basically, there's the certainty that you're probably going to fail a few times. Mm-hmm. But, it, it, you know, it, it takes a different kind of individual, I think, to, to do that kind of stuff, to step out. And you see a lot of immigrants that, um, especially immigrants that came, you know, my parents' generation or my grandparents' generation that that were entrepreneurs. And I, I don't necessarily think... I think, number one, there was the opportunity when they came to America where there weren't very many, especially when my grandparents came here or my grandfather came here, there weren't many barriers to to enter the market. You could just open a business and it wasn't a lot of you know, red tape or things that made it difficult. But I think the other part, and this is an interesting one, is I think that there's a little bit of a self-selection bias. Like the same kind of people who are willing to leave their country of origin and move to a country where they don't know anybody mm-hmm. and don't know the language – those are the same kind of people that are more likely to take that risk mm-hmm. of doing something, you know, on their own. I think that, yeah, that's definitely the determining factor is like how much you're willing to put yourself out there and endure um, failures and endure things and obstacles in your way mm-hmm. and, and, and like how you react to that. Depending on what kind of safety net you have, you know, are you like dependent on that or do you just know that it's there it's like it, it's all in the individual and how they um they want to pursue whatever goal it is in front of them well so. look at look at the stat right there it says 71.5 percent of the respondents came from middle class backgrounds and then there's 30 34 percent 36 percent were upper and lower so that's a big chunk though 36 percent from lower middle class yeah yeah but i'm that actually looking at it closer though some of these statistics don't add up <laughs> well yeah it's weird Oh, really? Those percentages don't add up to 100%, so I'm not sure where they're getting those. Okay. <laughs> Out of 200%. Yeah. yeah. yeah it's, a new, it's a new way to do things. Yeah. I mean, according to this, I don't know where Doug just pulled this out of his ass, but according to this, it's, you know, it's, it's, there's relatively the same amount of people that are come from a rich home that come from a poor home that end up being successful entrepreneurs, and the majority of them fall right in the m- middle class mm-hmm. area. So, yeah, um, it's. I wonder what. Per- I know it says here that ninety five percent of them had earned bachelor's degrees. I've seen other statistics that show that it's a little bit lower than that. I'd like to compare that to just the average person working, you know, out there. Uh, probably more, right? I would say probably more of them have a, a, a degree than less. But a lot of the entrepreneurs I know became entrepreneurs and stopped going to. To college because they felt like it wasn't contributing to you know what they wanted to do mm-hmm. when they worked out when they went out in the real world and I don't know if there's that much that can prepare you I mean what kind of schooling can prepare you for entrepreneurship yeah I don't know that there is such a thing other than just to do it you know it's a really just like getting into it and having sort of confidence in yourself that you're going to learn I think apprenticeship or, or working that's probably under the other best people, way to do yeah. it yeah do you would you encourage your sons to be entrepreneurs or to to work for other people, or you just kind of let them do that? Yeah, own? that would be tough. But I mean, I definitely would encourage them to pursue um, something that I feel they could f- they they would construct themselves. Like if they had an mm-hmm. idea that was something that had legs to it. Um, I mean, I would challenge them, of course. Like I would challenge them to consider. Uh, all the different obstacles, all the different um, things that will will be challenging, but um, at the same time, yeah, man, I want to I want to definitely help to 
contribute, you know, if they have, if they're passionate about it. Cause that's the thing. I think it, it, people just need to find their passion and that, that creates this, this purpose and that creates something in their life. That's like substantial. And I think that people can find that in certain jobs where they work for somebody too. Mm -hmm. So, um, say it's something that, somebody has a company that's awesome and is doing great things and it, it fits within their skill set. you know, go fucking do that, do that and do it well. Um, but if, if you're not finding that in the market and you want to create something like, fuck yeah, go do, go do your own thing. Yeah. I had a conversation with my son about college and we talk, we talk about, you know, educ- and he's, he does real well in school, really enjoys uh, learning and he gets really good grades and all that. And so we talked about college and the cost of how expensive it is to go to college. Oh, you know why? I was watching this comedian on Netflix. can't remember his name. Just came out with a comedy special. And he talks about how he spent, I think, one hundred and fifty dollars or $200,000 on college mm. and to get an English degree. <laughs> and he was making fun of himself for doing it. Yeah. And now he's a comedian, obviously. And he's like, it was a waste of money. And he was talking about how they asked, they were asking for uh, another more donation now. Like he got a letter from the school and he's like, you're not getting shit from me. I already gave you guys 150 grand for an English degree. Anyway. Hilarious. But, but think about that though. He's probably using a lot of that skill within writing and contributing towards his stand-up comedy. Maybe. Right. So I talked to my, I, I was talking to my son about college and I said, you know, schools, college is very expensive nowadays. You do really well in school. You'll probably do really well in college. But when it comes to the money to pay for college, um, I'm definitely gonna. Uh, oh, John Mulaney was the name of the. the comedian. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Good, good show. I'm like, you know, I'll, I'll pay for, I'll probably pay for your college, only if I know there's gonna be a good return, not for me, but for you. It's got to mm. be worth the money. So if you're gonna get a degree, that's gonna cost me, you know, a hundred something thousand dollars, but your degree in the market isn't worth very much. Then there's other ways to learn about that subject. Like, is, there, want, is there any degree that's worth? <laughs> is there? Yeah. So I'd like to hear what you think. Engineering, maybe? because when you when you break it down mathematically, like uh, a school loan that's fifty thousand or above, like how many years the average American, how much money, first of all, the average American has to make in order to save that much money to put that away. You know, do you know what that is? It's oh, worth, it's ridiculous. Yeah, it's crazy. If, but it's worth it when the job you want to do or the career you want to you want to follow has a barrier to enter that requires a right. d- degree. You guys just reminded me of this movement going on right now. Are you guys familiar with them? The, it's the it's the fire movement. Doug, look this up. Look up. <laughs> no. Google, Google, no, I'm serious. Are people so, laying themselves on fire. Yeah. No, yeah. these are okay. these are uh, millennials that are retiring at the age of 30 and they're doing it by a aggressively saving and they're saving like 80% of their income from the day they start working all the way up until they can retire at 30 years old. And what are they retiring with? How much so money? The fire fire stand. What? What's the acronym stand for? There it is, right uh, there. Financial, financial independence and early retirement. Right. I love oh, it. I like Sc- it. Scroll down this. It's pretty crazy. Yeah, these but, kids are way smarter than we give them bro, credit for. Bro, there's more entrepreneurs that are millennials than than there were in previous generations. Yeah, I believe it. It's a, it's the entrepreneur generation. They are they're saving That's over fucking awesome over eighty percent of their. Annual but what does that income. look like money wise? Well, so th- it doesn't matter. Th- it's that, whatever they decide it's a, their it's lifestyle. A, yeah, it's a formula. So it applies to somebody who makes sixty grand mm-hmm. a year or somebody who makes a hundred hundred ninety grand a year. Like you're saving eighty, and obviously, you if you're making a hundred ninety, you're going to have a lot more to live off of. So they're retirement. super super frugal, like uh, throughout their childhood, basically. Yeah, all the way till almost thirty years old. Now I. I, well, look, if your annual expenses are $40,000, then you're financially independent when your total net worth is a million. So, I mean, you could retire at 30 with a million dollars. You're just going to have to live on less than 40 grand a year. Right. And if you, which you can do if you're, I mean, you can, if you're smart and you can do that in a lot of places in the country. Well, yeah. and, that, and not that's, here, but that's what they talk about. Now, and I live I, on your friend's couch. I couldn't do this. I just I'm not I'm not a fan of this at all. And, and let me tell you <laughs> yeah, why I'm not either. a fan of this. And I, I know I'm sure and I have buddies that would be super pro this is I, I and I look back at you know something decisions that I made at 25. There's for sure a trip to Vegas where mm. I easily spent 10 to $20,000. Jesus right? Christ, Which, Adam. Yeah, right. So and <laughs> and <laughs> yeah, that's a lot, Jesus. Right. And at that time maybe had 100,000 saved up. And so arguably spending one ten- tenth of your yeah. Right, right. Right. So I I that was irresponsible as a 24. But if you were to ask me as a, you know, as an adult now at 36 years or grown ass man, 36 years old that wouldn't probably go do that again. 
do I would did I regret that or did I have the memories that I have? Man, that was probably one of the most epic fucking trips sure. I ever took. And and is that memory more valuable to me than having been right. a little bit more ahead of my retirement plan? That's a really that you got to really weigh that out. And some people the the plus say, you're more interesting. Yeah, right, yeah. I have way better. Like I have way kids, better campfire God, stories. God, you're so smart, but you're fucking boring. Well, yeah. no, I don't want to hang out with you. No, you can't say that. These guys might no, have some very interesting no. lives. You don't know that. Just because. <laughs> but I get what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. Uh, here's why I like it. I like it because I like my philosophy. The way I look <laughs> well, well, here's why I like this philosophy. It, it teaches hard work. It teaches sacrifice. And I, I don't think a lot of people will retire at 30. I think they'll yeah. be in a position where. They can retire. They keep going. Yeah, but they just keep going. Imagine having a million net worth at thirty, yeah. which means you've invested, you've saved, you've set yourself pretty. I mean, up pretty fucking well. I appreciate well. it, but I'm I'm pretty much with Adam on this one. Like, I want to make life experiences that yeah. I reflect on. That um, you, you're just not gonna you're just not gonna put yourself in that. You, you know, you're not going to put yourself out there to where you're going to experience like a lot of yeah. things because you're so frugal and, and all your friends are going to go places. You're going to stay at home. You're going to, you know, make these compromises. At, at my rate, it would take double the time with my philosophy. It would take double the time of what they are because my philosophy is this, like at the, doesn't matter if I make, if I was making 40 grand a year or I'm making half a million dollars a year. It doesn't matter. The same philosophy applies, and that's the same. I don't ever want to retire. It's I think s- retiring is death. Well, I agree with that. Yeah, but you want to be in a position where you could. Yeah, financial you freedom you want, is different. Yeah, you yeah. want to be responsible. So this is how I look at it, okay? So no matter how much you're making, as long as I'm saving or investing the same amount that I blow in that month. So for example, if my overhead is $3,000 a month in bills and I only make $3,500, that means I got two hundred fifty dollars to blow that month, mm-hmm. and I got two hundred fifty that needs to be saved and invested, and it scales all the way up. Mm-hmm. So if you see me flaunting a fucking new watch or a cool car, or a new pair of sneakers, or whatever, you can guarantee that you I put, put that same amount. I put that same amount away, either in a savings or stock or whatever. Oh, yeah. I like I mean, that, yeah. right? And it, what that and it does a great. What it does for me is this: it, it pushes me and it motivates me to make more if I want more things. You know, so I got to work harder if I want to buy these things, and then it also keeps me responsible why I'm doing that too. So I, I think that I like I love this movement because it's making working hard and saving cool again, and we need that yeah. because there's so much of a mentality on consume, 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 right? Not work hard. No, I appreciate it yeah. for sure. Yeah, I like this movement because it's making it cool. If it grows, it's making it cool again for people to because it. I, I think the pendulum needs a swing in that direction. We have so much stuff now and so much shit and so much that we can buy mm. that I think part of the reason why this is becoming cool is because kids can get whatever they want. So like, no, cool. I want to go in this other direction and I want to wear the cheaper shoes and I want to wear the more basic clothes. And have you noticed like cool cars and stuff like that and driving? It's becoming less hip for kids. Yeah. Oh, it they is. don't give a shit we, as well, much. Think about this. We were, in, we, were in, uh, we were in Austin. Maybe this is where... Um, this guy was telling me that he got an Audi, like a brand new Audi that he was just like cruising around in. And it's like, they're doing this whole thing where you could have like the brand new model and you're just driving it around like for a pretty reasonable price. Oh, where they rent the other car? Yeah. But oh, that's yeah. like one of those top of the line things that like you had to make a shit ton of money to be able to even step into that car. And now it's like the ease of access to something like that is it, it's just, it's going to be less cool you know, going forward. So. No, I, I like it. I, I like this. Oh, movement. it's it, it's like the same movement as the the guys that did the Netflix series or whatever. A couple of, we talked about this in the minimalist. Podcast. Yeah, the minimalist, yeah. and they did the houses like that. I, I don't know. I I can get on board with some things, and there's some things I just can't get on board with. Like there's just sorry, I can't live in a five by five fucking house. <laughs> just not, not. But you know what though? It's weird. I mean, no, I take that back. Yes, I could live in a five by. Yeah, I choose not, not to, to do yeah, that. There you, go. you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like I could live in a not in a house that small, but uh, but I, I would like to. I, I don't need a big house. I now, just I like a little land. Now here's the thing, though, where and where I do like it, and I do respect it, because I also grew up in a home too, where I thought my my family was very irresponsible financially. So I yeah. I do see that side of it. Like I I right. think yeah, if if you can only if you can only get a job where you make thirty forty grand a year. Then yeah, you probably shouldn't be living in a in a, a house that costs you twenty five hundred dollars a month. That doesn't make fucking yeah. economic sense, dude. Like that's no. silly to do that. A lot of things are getting cheaper though. We're talking about uh, the article that was up there. We're talking about traveling cheaper. And this guy said that he I saw a line where Airbnb. Yeah, he bought a two hundred dollar gift certificate, an Airbnb gift certificate online for one hundred. You guys know how bucks. I feel about that, dude. Yeah, Airbnb is. Oh, it's it's fucking destroying. The bees knees. I, it is destroying the hotel business. So after this last 
time we were over uh, in Austin, I did some more reading on it, and I knew that the hotel industry was lobbying government to try to crack down on Airbnb because it's killing their business. Of course, because you could spend three hundred dollars a night in a four star, you know, five star hotel in some areas, or you could spend. Three hundred dollars a night in a fucking massive house. Yeah, yeah. in the same it's, area. It's all your own. In the same area. Yeah. yeah, you know where you have a kitchen, you have whatever you you know you have a backyard. And they're stepping the amenities up. So the last house we had, we had a concierge. If we wanted, if we wanted food delivered to our house, if we wanted groceries, we all we had to do is call the concierge service at a house, and they went and delivered it to us. So the knock would be when this first started. I remember was like, oh well, you know, a hotel you get. You know, your bed's made and your house clean or your room clean and then you get room service. Well, guess what? A lot of these big companies are coming in and buying up 20, 30 yep. of these properties and, they, and they're providing these services. Yep. Mm -hmm. So fucking hotel business is game over. They're done. Right? And the reason game why, over. and I was talking to Jessica about this, and she's like, well, why are hotels so expensive? And I said, well, part of the reason is they, they you know, they have the cleaning services and restaurants and all that stuff. The other part of it is the regulations to yeah. have a hotel Make that shit super expensive, whereas... They're going to pay the city all kinds of money. Way less when you have a house. You know what I mean? There's way less regulations, way less control. It's the new share economy that's happening in conjunction with the gig economy or whatever. Or maybe it's both. Like, mm -hmm. here's another one. You, we, you, you talked about people who have uh, private jets who are like Airbnb... Not Airbnb. Well, it's kind of like Airbnb or Uber, but with right. a jet. Bro, if that shit explodes... Think about that. Think huh. about how uh, what that's going to do to the airline industry. Oh yeah. Oh, when yeah. you just you can pay a fee to get on someone's private jet. Imagine now if you're a private jet owner, you park your plane. That shit's costing you money to sit there. Oh, You'd probably God. be willing to charge. They're going to be cheap. stoked. Yeah, because just having a plane and and being able to fuel it costs so much money to keep fuel in those planes. So it's like, yeah, you want to use it. You know, you want to get people on and and make it worth your money. Yeah. Next question is from the Lab Strength. Why do so many bodybuilders still use the body part split method? I hear people say because a big name bodybuilder or other pros have been doing it this way, but clearly MAPS programming is far superior. So, well, two, yeah. Yeah, two things. First, we got to be clear here. The body part splits can be very effective when you utilize intensity and frequency uh, more effectively. The reason why a lot of body part split methods are not effective for most people is because a lot of them do this whole hit each body part once a week type of thing. And that just and that simply is not enough frequency. That's what makes it inferior to MAPS. Yes. It's, that it's not body, that it's split. Yeah, body part splits are not inferior to MAPS programming. It's what we knew, okay, what we know because we've been doing this for a really long time and we've ran splits ourselves and we've had all kinds of clients run them and all kinds of friends run them. And what ends up happening when you do a body part split, it's really tough, one, to hit a muscle group every muscle group two to three times a week without actually sitting down and putting some thought into the programming. And then what ends up happening when you're training one muscle group a day, you tend to just hammer the fuck out of it intensity wise. So, and those are two of the things I think that are, are, are abused or overlooked in our space. And so it may seem like maps is extremely superior to it, but it's not, it's not the split versus maps and the splits suck and maps are superior. No, you can apply the maps methodology to splits. You can apply the maps methodology uh, and concepts to any workout program. But the, the traditional splits that we see a lot... And by the way, when splits first came out, they weren't like they are now. So a lot of the splits you see people follow today are, you know, Monday chest, Tuesday back, for, you know, Wednesday, you know, shoulders and so on. The old splits, like back in the 70s, like Arnold's time, they were hitting body the whole body two or three times a week. So although they did split the body, yeah. it was still two to three times a week uh, of frequency of training mm -hmm. each body part, which that's the essential part. That's the reason why splits tend to not work. Now, why do we see pro bodybuilders still doing the old split where they're hitting one body part a day? Because they're pro bodybuilders and yeah. they have they're they nothing. They recover, yeah. Well, they have nothing in common with you at all. Yeah. They, they have their bodies probably... So when you lift weights really hard... You get this adaptation signal that elevates, and we can measure it with uh, muscle protein synth sy synthesis. So we can see that the body's repairing and building muscle. That signal drops very quickly at about 48 hours, maybe 72 hours for a beginner, shorter for someone who's advanced. That, that signal goes down, and it goes back down to baseline. So although you're still recovering and you've got like four days left till you hit your chest again, your body's not building muscle anymore, and that's the problem. Now, a pro bodybuilder has got, number one, 
vastly superior genetics to you listening right now. And I, I can't stress this enough. I've been around some, and I've been around a lot of people who've worked out. I've managed gyms for 20 years, right? I've been in fitness for a long time. I can count on one hand when I've been around someone with genetics that are just, you think they're an alien. And for sure, when they lift weights, that anabolic signal stays up much longer than the average person. I mean, there was one guy, there was one trainer that worked for me. He was, uh, actually, no, he wasn't a trainer. He was a porter. And he didn't have a lot of money. And dude would eat, like, a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And sometimes he'd have a bowl of cereal or top rock because he didn't have a lot of money. So he didn't eat much at all. Probably under 100 grams of protein a day. Um, and the dude would, after work, he'd go out and he'd work out and he'd hit, you know, a couple exercises. And he would do shit like skull crushers with 225. You know, he would do you know, overhead shoulder presses with the hundreds. And it was just, I would look at him and be like, this dude, is he's got to be on something. And I'd talk to him and he's like, no, man, I can't even afford food, let alone, you know, anabolic steroids. He just had genetics that I couldn't, it didn't make sense to me because my body never responded that way. I'd never seen it. And that's how pro bodybuilders are. Their bodies respond extremely well to resistance training. And then on top of that, you throw uh, anabolic steroids. So, what they do to their body to get their body to change and work and grow is very different from what most of you guys and girls listening right now are going to do. Most of you, if you follow the same method as the bodybuilder, you're not going to get very far. You're probably doing it right now. You might be doing it right now where you go to the gym, you get real sore, you, re you rest, recover, you go back to the gym and your body hasn't responded or, or, or hasn't changed. And so you're wondering what the hell is going on. You probably need to hit your body parts a little bit more frequently. That's the MAPS philosophies is is kind of based on that and you know I remember when I first start when I first put that together it was a long time ago I was uh getting ready to go on a trip uh, uh, to Italy and I wanted to get real lean and in muscular for it because I wanted you know my family I hadn't seen my family in a long time and that was the first time I started really training my body twice a week and I remember the first couple weeks I did it I realized that I couldn't go to failure on my lifts like I used to because I'm hitting more frequency. So I stopped going to failure and I had the increased frequency. And then I remember my body was just growing and responding like crazy. And that's when I first pieced that together. Like, oh, I need to hit my body parts a little bit more frequently. Well, I think it's important people realize too that when I was competing, I, I wasn't running like a MAPS red. I mean, I was running a, a black, MAPS black, and then the evolution of MAPS black as I continued to go show after show. So... You know, eventually, my programming looked like if you know Maps had a baby with a split program. I mean, it was I'm I'm in the gym seven days a week and at the professional level, like my level of volume is so different than where my volume is right now. Now, the cool part is I can put in a quarter of the work that I was putting in to compete at the professional level and still have a really good physique. You know, and so I, again, I think for the average person who doesn't have, you know, seven to 14 hours a week to put into the gym, you know, and hammer the body like that and can consistently be feeding it to recover and resting correctly or on anabolics and shit. Like then, yeah, the a basic split, a full body split routine is, is going to be superior. Hence why we created that. But it doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, maps is maps three by or three times a week, you know, basic anabolic program is better than, a split program. We just knew that it was going to be better for a majority of the people out there because we've been dealing with a majority of people. What percentage would you say of people do better training, you know, two to three times a week their whole body or or just hitting 80, each body part two to three three 80, times a week? That's what I would say. 80 to 85 percent. Yep. 80 to yeah. 85 percent of the people, which is why someone like this who's answering this is or asking this question feels that it's far superior. Like it's going to feel far superior for most people. Mm -hmm. And then there's going to be a small amount of people that I think will still benefit greatly from it and be like, holy shit and be impressed by it. But then might be like, well, I don't feel like it was way better than when I was training seven days a week, all this. Time. Well, yeah. Okay. Well your body, it maybe is bit, you've built up enough muscle mass. You've built so much that you can handle that much volume. But the average person, you know, that's more than enough, volume to build an incredible physique off of. Yeah, the average, the, so far from what I've seen, when I've had guys who do, and, and I've seen this with guys who who do body part splits for a long time and who are relatively muscular and strong, and then they switch to training each body part more frequently. On average, when they report back to me, it's anywhere between a, a, a four to seven or eight pound muscle gain. 
mm. in a short period of time. That's a lot. That's a lot of muscle to put on your body when you've been working out for a long time. Happened to my cousin. My cousin Gabriel was what did a body part split, switched over to more frequent training of uh, each body part, and he gained seven pounds of lean body mass in something like like two months, yeah. which to him was just absolutely mind blowing. Well, I think too we're we're addressing like the major our audience, the majority of our audience was doing split like type of a routine. And I think that's why our message um, of doing this full body approach was so impactful because you know people hadn't really thought to train that way during the week, and um, obviously there's there's um, you know, if somebody has been doing like, um, you know, full body routines and like more of a functional type training for, for quite some time, they could benefit greatly from doing a split routine. And, you know, obviously there's some tweaks that, that, that could be made, That's to, the key. you know, to, to keep that, uh, frequency in, you know, involvement there, but it's, it's a different mentality. And I think that, you know, certain people, even my, myself could, could benefit from going through yeah. something like you that. You don't see athletes ever training in a split. No. Ever. No. No. It, it, and it's usually full body or movement based, I would say, right? Right. Yeah. When you played football, what would you get? Would you guys do the same exercises each time or was it like? Yeah. I mean, we would just do mainly your compound like exercises. So like we would just stick with squats in cleans and you know front squats and overhead press and you know all like basic barbell moves we wouldn't isolate we mm -hmm. wouldn't do any kind of like um you know single joint type exercises and so that's where i know personally when i do address that and i, I bring that in incorporate it into my programming what a benefit you know, I get from that and it, it feeds right back into the compound list. Well, especially from a sculpting perspective, I think you can be completely healthy and fine doing all these functional movements your whole entire life. But let's be honest, a majority of people deep down inside want a look for their body too. Sure. I mean, overall, yes, I think most people that listen to Mind Pump are chasing health. And I think that's a, a big part of our message. But I also think that you'd be a fool to think that some people don't want a better looking physique. I'm already putting the work in. I'm already making sacrifice food wise. How about I get to sculpt my body yep. too? Why the fuck not? Sure. And this is where it's fun. Yeah. And this yeah. is where isolate isolation exercises and splitting the body, certain muscles up and just attacking them. Like I can see lots of benefit behind it and I, I not just benefit. Like I think it's mandatory. If you're going to try and sculpt a physique, uh, like a competitor, right, or a bikini or a men's physique type of an athlete that gets on stage, it's necessary. I, I dare you to try and, and compete against me with only barbell compound lifts while I'm sculpting my physique because that's what's the cool part is that you can, and you maybe can argue you could be a stronger, more functional person for me, but that's not what I'm doing. I'm trying to shape my body to give an illusion that it's mm -hmm bigger or has more of an hourglass or whatever and that that that's where a lot of it's this all got value yeah. it yeah. all has value and it's yeah. fun to switch from one to the other yeah, there's an artistry to that for yeah. sure the next question is from the rachel d what are the best ways to keep track of progress i'm consistently working out bumping up weight if it's too easy eating clean most of the time and i'm still the same weight and it's easy to get unmotivated so here's why i i picked this question it's an important topic because I, you'll notice she's talking about how she's being able to work out. She seems to be getting stronger, you know, eating clean, which means she's probably doing really good with the food. But she's looking at just her body weight, and that's what's unmotivating her. And the reason why I want to talk about this was because there's so many parameters that you can look at to, uh, to look at how your body's changing and improving. One of them is your body weight. And I think what happens with a lot of people is they make that the only parameter. Like that is the most important only parameter and they ignore all the other signs that their bodies right. may be progressing. You know, like I, when I'm working on mobility, I'm not getting stronger in the gym. So I'm not going up in weight. But what I'm noticing is maybe a better range of motion or more control or maybe a little bit less pain. Or maybe you're, you know, you're, you're fixing your diet and you're not losing weight, but your skin, your skin is clearing up and your digestion is getting better and you feel more energy. There's a lot of things you can look at that all tell you about your progress and, and only one of them is your weight. And by the way, can you lose or gain weight? Let's say your goal is to lose weight. Can you lose weight and it be not progress? Absolutely. Like what if you start getting leaner and you feel fucking terrible and shitty and your quality of life has decreased? 
You know, you may be fooling yourself and telling yourself that you're progressing. Right, or we talked about this not. the other day. What if you lose weight and you're losing just as much muscle mass as you're losing body fat? You know what I'm saying? Yeah, then, frustrating. Yeah, then you're really not getting any healthier. Your body fat percentage isn't going down. It's You're losing muscle mass. As, so it's I, the scale is such a terrible indicator. Yeah. I mean, I use it, but I use it just as a, a, another, another tool to give me feedback, not like as the tool to give me feedback. In fact... It's probably one of the least important ones out of all things, but it does help. You know what I'm saying? Mm. I'm just trying to I'm trying to gather all this information, how I feel, how I look. Do you what, contrast that with I know how you have people really tracking their water specifically too and like in their diet and like whether they're retaining water or not, and then also using the scale well, in there, conjunction. Great point right there. I mean, I find tracking your water is more important than tracking your weight on your scale because they're they're inversely related. Right. You you start drinking, you drink a half a gallon more of water every single day, you're gonna go up in the scale it's fucking inevitable that's gonna happen the body doesn't just it doesn't just keep flushing it all out as fast the same like you're gonna hold on to some of it for every three ounces of of carbohydrates your body intakes you hold three gram three grams of water so if if you're eating and you're drinking more water it's inevitable you're gonna hold and retain a little bit more water which in turn is gonna have the scale go up which has nothing to do with you getting fitter Right. You could be building muscle and burning body fat, but then holding some water, which also can kind of manipulate the way you look. You could look a little puffy and water, like water down a bit because you've increased that or you've increased your carbohydrate intake. So there are many things. As far as progress, this is what I like to track. And you just saw me uh, over the last month post every single workout that I did and and track that for everyone to see. Now, um, it bores me to death to do it. Uh, to continue doing it, so that's why you haven't seen me doing it lately. But I'm still on my training, and what I what I do, and the reason why it's boring is I'm kind of like going back through a lot of the same stuff, but I'm adding volume. So now every time I I do a workout that I did last month, I'm increasing the volume either through weights if I feel really strong that day. So if it's a day I get in the gym and I'm I'm like following a routine that I did last month, and I'm get, getting ready to lift, and I'm like, man, I feel like I feel strong today, so I'm going to push some weights up. I'm going to, you know, increase whatever my lifts are by five or ten pounds or whatever it is. That's one way to increase the volume. Or maybe it's a day I come in and I don't feel strong and I feel tired. I'm like, but I'm still going to get my workout in for the day. And so what I might do is add sets. I might add a set to all the exercises that I'm doing. That's another way I can increase volume. And I know that if I am adding volume to my routine, I'm making progress. My body is getting stronger. It's adapting to handling more volume. Therefore, I'm progressing. Even if my scale or the mirror isn't isn't showing me uh, what I would like it to see today because based off of whatever I could have done the day before. Otherwise, it can get really daunting the amount of things that you'll need to track to to have a really accurate measure to uh, are you making progress I think it's just not? the problem is that we connect working out and diet to weight and we don't connect it to anything else when in reality if you eat right and you exercise it's connected to everything it will improve your quality of life in so many different ways not just changing your body weight. And when people understand, so when I coach people, this is a point that I I try to make with them. It's that has your quality of life improved? For example, let's say somebody, you know, they, they clean up their diet and they start working out with me, but they're eating still a lot of food. They're still eating as many calories as they were before. So the weight never changes, but they're in the gym, their mobility increases, they're stronger, they're eating healthier or at least making better choices so that, so that they're, you know, they're feeling better, their digestion's better. Uh, their energy is probably better. They're probably sleeping better, better sex drive. Their quality of life has improved even though their body weight hasn't changed. So I think it's important that we connect exercise and nutrition to everything and not just weight. And what you'll find when you do that is, A, you'll treat your workouts and nutrition more appropriately. So rather than like, because what happens when the scale doesn't go down, even though your quality of life might have increased, but the scale hasn't changed, you may go into the gym and go after it or, or in a way that you maybe shouldn't or you maybe change your workouts when they were actually... I don't want to see any weight loss. If I have a client comes in, they say, I want to lose 40 pounds, Adam. They just hired me. They came off the holidays. They've been off the wagon for a long time, eating shit, not really exercising, tired of it. They're fed up with this extra weight. And they say, Adam, I'm going to pay you whatever it takes to lose this 40 pounds. The goal for them you know, after I take their money, right? Because it never works if I do this. After, yeah. I, after I take their money, I say, listen, the goal is we're not going to lose any weight right now. 
Give me my money back. Scale. My goal week over week is to see your scale about the same. For now, we'll eventually get the you know drop the weight, or maybe we won't. You may end up loving the way your body looks when I completely change it without ever moving the fucking scale. For me, if I see a huge drop right out the gates, I'm worried that I, I'm starving you too much or I'm overtraining you too much. In fact, I know if I'm training you and you're working out what you weren't doing before and I'm helping you make better food choices throughout the week, I know good things are happening. Progress is happening. And the scale swinging up or down dramatically are both bad signs. Even if the goal is to lose 40 pounds, you drop 10 pounds in a week, that's a bad sign. That is not good. I did not, I'm not feeding you enough or I'm pushing you hard too fast. I don't need to do that. So the goal really is to kind of keep the body weight the same while we kind of figure out what homeostasis is. Like, what does the body want to be fed? Is it responding when we train this way? Then we can start to manipulate that. And that's a hard thing to tell somebody who wants to lose 20, 30 pounds that, hey, I don't want you to lose any weight. Mm-hmm. You'd be blown away how much you can change your body composition without ever moving the scale, ever. And I did, th- those that have been following since the beginning of when I first started all this shit, what, I stayed at 213 pounds over like four month period. It was literally give or take two pounds, up or down. That was mostly water. But the, that was the goal. And I was explaining that as I was going through that journey was watch me keep my weight right around the same, but completely change my mm-hmm. body composition. Mm-hmm. And the hardest part about it is the mental piece. You know, that's the, it's, it's just, it mentally fucks with you when you think that you want to lose all this weight and the scale's not moving. But in reality, you really don't want that. In fact, if you're adding, if you're adding resistance and you're slowly over time increasing volume and you're adding more resistance to your training, you're fucking building muscle. Yep. I, I promise you're building muscle and it's way more dense than body fat is. No. And so if you see an, an, a, a nice, a beautiful place to be when you're trying to get in shape is a nice little exchange of, you lost a pound of fat, you added a pound of muscle. You lost a pound of fat, which equals zero, which means that doesn't the scale doesn't move. But if you can keep that pace for six to eight, 10, 12 weeks. Totally of, change your body. Oh yeah. my God. Are you kidding me? I mean, adding adding 10 pounds of muscle over the course of three months and only losing 10 pounds of fat, which equals a net zero move, movement on the scale, that is a fucking whole different person. Whole different person. That's a twenty. That's a twenty pound difference, right? Even though it's ten body fat, ten fat, you're losing ten muscle. You're building net zero on the scale, but that person will look like twenty pounds has changed. Yeah, totally then, different. Then you just highlight all the rest of the variables that are going on with this person throughout this whole process, right. like your sleep, your strength, your energy. You know the the way you're pooping. You know the way you're digesting food. Like like you just have to sort of present all these other things that are going on, so that way you understand that you're changing your entire body. This isn't just like about shedding you know part of your body. Uh, you know, Sal says it all the time on the show, and I love it. It's you know chase health, chase health first, and and then the fitness thing will come if you're looking at those things, those those uh you know feedback that your body's giving you as far as sleep and energy and mood and skin and hair and sex and like those are all fucking great and exercise and nutrition done properly contribute positively to everything because it's your health it's your total health and when you look at all those parameters then you don't get unmotivated because you're looking at your you know you're making a list and you're like okay wow look at this i'm sleeping better my energy is better my skin is better levels are down look at my mobility is increased the scale hasn't changed, but you know what? I've got all these other things that are positive. Mm-hmm. Fuck yeah, man. I feel good about what I'm doing. Instead of like ignoring all those things, which a lot of people do, looking at just the scale, which I did for years. Mm-hmm. I ignored everything but the scale, and it was so... It's uh, what's the it's so uh, deceiving. Mm-hmm. The scale was so deceiving. I'd want to gain weight all the time. I always want to pack. I was packing on body fat like a fucking polar bear. But because the scale went up, I was happy because I wanted to gain weight. Yeah. You know, same thing when I would try to get cut or whatever. It's just like sometimes you know one of the best things I can do sometimes for clients is I tell them don't weigh. Sometimes I tell them to weigh themselves. Sometimes I say the opposite. Don't weigh yourself anymore. Oh right. Get off the scale. We're this, not gonna care about this that. conversation speaks right to the intuitive guide. Mm-hmm. Like the, uh, even if you're not somebody, even if you're somebody who's going to be tracking, if you're somebody who's competing, even if like eating intuitively isn't something that you care about right now, this topic and the things that we're addressing right now, I think this is that's an excellent read just for that because that's the direction you want to head, especially if you struggle with this, 
you know, feeling of, oh, I'm not, am I breaking progress or am I not? Or be feeling like you're mm-hmm. a slave to the scale. Like the intuitive, the intuitive guide is a great read. The next question is from The Strength to Overcome. I often find people, myself included, tend to be self-deprecating as a sad attempt at being humble. What is your advice on being confident without being cocky? <laughs> <laughs> you know what cocky is? I like this. Cocky is somebody who's uh, who's pretending to be confident. That's what cocky is. When you see mm. somebody who's cocky mm. and, and yeah, they're faking and it. arrogant, that's mm. somebody who's not confident. So it's, so so you can be confident and not be cocky because confidence is not good way to describe. Is that. not cockiness. I heard uh, I read an interview a long time ago. Hicks and Gracie. I don't know if you guys know who he is. Mm-hmm. He's uh you know known jiu-jitsu as being master. one of the yeah one yeah. of the best jujitsu uh, you know masters of of the Gracie family. Doesn't compete or anything anymore, but he's kind of a badass and. He got interviewed by somebody a long time ago and he said, you know, how do you handle being a Gracie and getting challenged and people wanting to fight you all the time? Like, how, like, how are you so cool with that and okay with that? And he goes, you know, it was a five-year-old kid walked up to you right now and told you they wanted to kick your ass. Like, would you get all pissed off and, and angry and like throw a punch at him? And, <laughs> and he goes, of course not. And he goes, because you know, it's a five-year-old kid and you could you could have your way with them, you know, no problem. You could beat them up. You're not, you feel no threat. He goes, that's how I walk around all the time. I feel, and that's what confidence is. That's like, great. like if you knew you could kick everybody's ass, would you ever go to a bar and posture and act like a tough guy? No. no. You wouldn't give a shit. You'd, Always the tough, yeah. the, the real badasses are normally This is like why that. Kyle Kingsbury wears a, like pink unicorn shirts when he goes to the to bars. And, <laughs> yeah. Cause he doesn't like, <laughs> he doesn't he's give like, a fuck. Yeah. Like, what Say he, something to me. Yeah. yeah. Like it's not, it's not even that. Like he's just, he's just so calm and confident cause he knows he's, he's awesome. And that's really, that's really what confidence is. But I also find confidence in for myself I I got so much more confident when I became confident with not being the like the best person in the room at something or not being good at something. Hmm. When I became okay with that, then I got way more confident. Like if I'm in a situation where you know we're doing something and I know I'm not good or I'm not well versed or I don't have enough information, being okay with being okay with that made mm-hmm. a big difference. Mm-hmm. Like saying I don't know. Like I don't yeah, know. That's honestly I was going to voice the fact of the uh, when I was more honest and I I just gave up the whole trying to say something that I knew, you know, somebody would oh wow, they'd be they'd be dazzled by it or like dress up whatever I did with with more um story behind it and you know, just no, just tell exactly how it happened, um, exactly what I know. If I'm gonna voice in what I know and and I'm gonna say when I don't know something, it's just like I, you just you just get this immediate confidence boost because there's not all this pressure to be something that you're not. Mm-hmm. I I think the uh, uh, the making fun of yourself to uh, your attempt to be humble. I really think that that can also be a sign of your own insecurities. Like sure. to do that, like you don't. I, I I would take this approach. Like if they're instead of like making fun of myself in an area, I'll just be straightforward about it. like, man, that really. That, it scares me to do that or, yeah. you know, or man, when you just said that to me, fuck, that hurt my feelings. I didn't realize how much that hurt my feelings when you said that. I think like, okay, so you're a great book along these lines, uh, Jack Welch is winning. And I think I've mentioned it a long time ago on the show, but learning to be candid with people and radical honesty and being direct mm-hmm. uh, to me is a great sign of confidence. When somebody is so confident in who they are, they are not afraid to say how they feel and what's on their mind. And I think that uh, much of our insecurities, much of our cockiness uh, comes out when we are trying to pretend like we are something that we are not. Yeah. So, I, and, and that could also become with the, you know, making fun of yourself. That also can be that too, if where you're, you know, hey, if you're feel insecure about something, then uh, fucking voice it. Don't be afraid to say that. Yeah, and I think that's where a lot of comedy, I mean, I do that a lot, you know, and I, I definitely have a self-deprecating sort of, uh, uh, you know, uh, operating system, but it's more it's more about, like, contributing to make light of things. Like, like I am insecure about certain things. I know I suck at certain things. I'm going to jump and get to it before you have a chance. <laughs> so that's where we're at. I'm, I'm putting it all out there. And I feel great. You know, I feel great about like, you know, yeah, come say something I haven't already said. Mm-hmm. Well, I think self-deprecating humor can also be what we do on this show a lot. I think we have a, a natural flow between the three of us where I'll serve the guys up on something. 
I know I'm gonna get fucking eaten up on. Like, right. oh, I bring things up on purpose. I know you guys are gonna put. I know I'll say something that I did yeah. that I know you guys are gonna fucking make fun of me over. Right. But it's hilarious, and I also don't give a shit. Like, That's it's, it. it's all good. And That's why it works. I, the the dance between confident and co- cocky, I think, man, or it, what I used to say is the dance between being com- ultra confident and then also humble at the same time is one of the finest dances I think that you can ever learn to do. Um, and so important to being a great leader because you have to be able to have that confidence that people want to follow you because they they trust that you can lead them, but then also be humble enough to listen to them or to to be able to be like them too. And I think that it is a a a, a tough tough dance for a lot of people. And I think if you feel like you're trying to do it, that's already your first your first mistake. I think it's something that you will have over time. And I think the easiest way to start in that direction is learning again, being just radically honest, is learning to be speak your mind, to say how you feel, to not be afraid of others. People are going to judge you. People are going to make whether you, fun whether of you. Whether you like it or not. Yeah, no matter what. I don't care how fucking smart you are. I mean, look yeah, at some of the most- Just know it's coming. Look at some of the most brilliant minds and most famous, talented people out there that for as many people they have worship, worshiping them, they have as many people talking shit about them. So that's inevitable. So once you get comfortable with that, that people are always going to judge you and truly having the zero fucks, I don't give a fuck attitude about it, like- that's that's on them. That's a reflection of their insecurities mm-hmm. that they feel the need to voice talking shit about me, whatever that may be. I'm going to be me. And I and because I already know being me, I think is hard for people. I think it's hard for people to be me in this society that we live in today. So I think practicing being yourself and being comfortable with yourself will bleed into this confidence that you that you want to have and it won't come off as cocky. I think I think a lot of times when people think that others are, I, I used to come off cocky sometimes. And I think the reason why I came off cocky was because part of my confidence was partially like what Sal was saying was driven through insecurities because I was a, an insecure boy growing up. Now, as I got older and I became more comfortable in my own skin, that co- that cockiness definitely completely faded away. And it's a true confidence now that nobody's going to shake me no matter what you say. I to had me. this one client that I trained once uh, for a while. I trained him for about a couple of years. Great guy. He became one of my favorite people ever to work with. Super nice dude. Would come in. We'd have a great workout, great discussion. Just really liked the guy. And he drove a uh, Nissan Pathfinder that had like 250,000 miles. It looked like, you know, it looked like a car he'd had forever. And I had no idea, you know, you know where he lived or whatever. And, you know, I, I knew he was, uh, you know, I knew he had worked in medicine so I knew he was relatively successful, but I really know much. And I went over his house after a couple couple of years of working with him. And we dri- we're, again, we're driving, you know, he drives this, this piece of shit like Pathfinder. We drive up to his house and he has a fucking estate. Like, a, like I had no idea this guy had that much money, but it's because he wore regular clothes when he worked out. Sometimes his sweaters would have holes in them. And so then I asked him the next day after, after I went over his house, I trained him. And I'm like, dude, I'm like, you're a fucking baller. And he starts laughing. And I'm like, you've got a lot of money. I said, I would have never known. I said, why do you drive that that Pathfinder, that piece of shit Pathfinder? Because I was close with him. I could say that. And he goes, because it's still running. He goes, I really don't care about cars that much. He goes, but you can tell I, I like my house. So I spend a lot of money there and stuff. And I remember hearing that. I'm like, God, you know, how many people with that much money would be okay with driving a, a crappy car or whatever? Like he was a very confident, you know, self-confident type type of individual, and I really liked that about him, and it's probably what drew me to him. But I didn't know any of that stuff. I would have oh, never man. guessed. Yeah. Confidence in another human being is one of the most attractive qualities. Oh, men, you know, women doesn't matter. Does it not? Yeah, does not. Confidence is such an attract. And again, it, confidence to me really is just being yourself. Is That's being, what it is. Yeah. Being so comfortable with who you are, and I think it's I think it's more it's more difficult than people say that. Like it's so easy. But a lot of the, no, it's you, a constant struggle, and I mean, I, I mean, I was reading this book over over the weekend, and um, they were highlighting the fact that most most of the of the successful people that people idolize and and know have made it to the very top. Like they struggle with this imposter syndrome. They struggle with the fact that they don't feel like they're this this person with authority that has all the answers and like you know, on the top level, right? Like mm-hmm. everybody has that. Like they don't, they don't feel comfortable with all the eyes on them, but at the same time, 
yeah, the the people that do like you feel like exude the confidence. It's just that they know that um, they're being themselves and they can carry themselves and they can say whatever they can because um, they're just it, it's truly coming from them and and it, however people receive it is how they're going to receive it. Mm. Uh, look, if you haven't gone to our YouTube channel and subscribed, you are missing out. It's all different information. Uh, lots of videos. We post one almost every single day. Go to YouTube, go to Mind Pump TV, that's the name of our channel, and subscribe. Thank you for listening to Mind Pump. If your goal is to build and shape your body, dramatically improve your health and energy, and maximize your overall performance, check out our discounted RGB Super Bundle at mindpumpmedia.com. The RGB Super Bundle includes MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Performance, and MAPS Aesthetic. Nine months of phased expert exercise programming designed by Sal, Adam, and Justin to systematically transform the way your body looks, feels, and performs. With detailed workout blueprints and over 200 videos, the RGB Super Bundle is like having Sal, Adam, and Justin as your own personal trainers, but at a fraction of the price. The RGB Super Bundle has a full 30-day money-back guarantee, and you can get it now, plus other valuable free resources at mindpumpmedia.com. If you enjoy this show, please share the love by leaving us a five-star rating and review on iTunes and by introducing Mind Pump to your friends and family. We thank you for your support, and until next time, this is Mind Pump.